Hey, welcome to the Innovation Mindset Podcast powered by the Jim Moran College of Entrepreneurship. I am Mark McNeese, your host. And in studio today, we have a graduate of the Jim Moran Institute to small business uh, executive program, Jennifer Weingardner of Rabin Weingardner. Hey, Jennifer, thanks for coming in today. Hello, thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about your business and what kind of law that you practice. I, I practice business law. So I represent small businesses, which is really interesting that I would have attended and graduated from the Jim Moran the small business executive program, because I spent a lot of years helping small businesses get launched and get off the ground. And then I became a, I decided to approach my law firm as a small business and see what I could do with it. And it's now I know firsthand the challenges that small businesses face as I help them learn the ropes and figure out how to stick around for a while. So fellow educator Mm -hmm. and lawyer, it sounds. So let's go back a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about your history, how you got interested in law and small business. When, where did you go to college? When, where, when, how, what did you study? Obviously you passed the bar and all that kind of good stuff. Tell us a little bit about that and your early career uh, experience and then what got you into being an entrepreneur Great. Yeah. So I grew up in Cleveland in a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio, and my dad was a cop and my mom just always worked in some office environment. So it wasn't like I I knew I'd be doing something someday, but I went to a small little college in Cleveland. I was never going to leave. Majored in English because it was easy because I could read books and get a degree and decided that I couldn't be a teacher. I couldn't get past some of those early classes on educational theory. And I just went to law school. And I went to law school in Cleveland because I was never going to leave there. And I started practice in Cleveland. So the first three years I went, I was working for, I was clerking for a small firm. And in my last year of law school, the woman who owned that firm ran for judge and got elected. And so everybody was out getting jobs. And I was canvassing the neighborhood, petitioning for my boss to get a job that and I wasn't going to have one. So I, the small firm that came in and took over her clients, I sat down with them and I said, listen, I've been working on these files for a year and a half. I know all these people. I've talked with them all. I think you should keep me. And they made space for me. And the, they squeezed me in as something that wasn't really in their budget. And the, the quid pro quo was, we'll help you. We can't pay you a lot of money. You can be our part-time law clerk and maybe associate. And when I passed the bar, then they held my hand through growing a practice. And, okay. and at the time, it was like upsetting. I wasn't at a big law firm making a lot of money. I could never replace the experience that gave me. I was in trial that first year, like 12 times. I had six wow. jury trials. I had two appellate arguments. And they didn't charge me a penny. They didn't make me pay overhead. They gave me, fed me work. And then they sat with me second chair. I mean, the exper- you can't buy that kind of experience. It was like going to a graduate's program in becoming a lawyer. And I st- I'm still connected with the, those folks today. Three years later, I left. I moved to Florida. I came here. But we talk and, and help each other all the time. So it's been, um, that's been the, that, that's how I started. That's how I started. Became a, a good lawyer, a better lawyer from that. Came to Florida, worked for a big law firm, left for a while, clerked for a Supreme Court judge for several years, almost six years, Went back to the law firm and really learned the civil side of things. Early on, I was doing a lot of criminal stuff. And then when I moved to Florida, it was all civil stuff. And it was complicated things and real estate and transactional stuff. And so I had a full full meal of different kinds of law. Knowing that being in a big firm was just not going to be for me, I didn't like it. And I had an opportunity to leave in 2010 to work for a small little research company. And I took some clients with me. And really at the blessing and as a parting gift from the managing partner and who's also remained a a significant mentor to me, bid me farewell, sent me with some clients. And then I learned really that was the start of learning how to run a business, Mm -hmm. how to be a business, Mm -hmm. how to take what we're doing as in research and writing and advocacy and turn that into a business. 
because we took it out of the law context and we were doing research for investors outside of Tallahassee. So it was a boot, another kind of training session with another mentor who was a significant role player in teaching me how to do that. That's fantastic. So you mentioned that you didn't ever want to leave Cleveland and then boom, you're in Florida. What, what was the catalyst for that? Oh, I followed a boy. That's, that's <laughs> the long and the short of it. My husband got a job at Florida State. Oh, okay. So we have deep ties to Florida State. Not only was he still a professor, but my daughter went to Florida State for undergrad. She's in law school oh, at wow. Florida State now. And, and I did. I taught here too. I was an adjunct for a hot minute at the law school. Oh, okay. Right on. Your husband, what college is he in? He's in arts and sciences. He teaches creative writing in the English department. Okay. Right on. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay. You were, it sounds like you've had some great mentors and it actually mm -hmm. says a lot about you that you're keeping in contact with your past mentors and that you recognize that they were instrumental in your growth and things like that. So you were working in a small firm, then a big firm and all these different things. How... What was the catalyst for you starting your own business? What what was going on in your life at that time? And what was that drive for you to take that risk, right? And take a step out on your own? Like it was opportunity and it was taking it. The research company that I was at, the owner of that company decided that she was either going to sell her company or just shut it down. And we were able to work out, you know, a, we would just work it out where I would buy it. I still had some law firm clients on the side, so I was practicing on my own. I was running my own practice, but I wasn't doing it as a business. I was just holding on to clients that were my favorites, my long term, that people mm -hmm. had always worked with. And I said, "All right, I'm gonna, I'll do this. This is, I'm never gonna have this chance again. It's already here. I know how to run this." And I got, I, I did it. I jumped. I had a safety net. I knew I was always gonna, I could always get a job as a lawyer somewhere. Right. I had really hadn't burned any bridges. So I knew I could go and get a job. This was the chance. And I, it was like a graduate program in how to do, I had to learn marketing. I had to learn sales. I had to learn backroom stuff. I had to learn numbers. I was always just getting a paycheck. Mm -hmm. The law stuff, I was sending invoices out and collecting them, but I wasn't really paying overhead. I wasn't doing any of those things. So right. I had to really figure out based on books, based on podcasts and or, yeah, pod, really podcasts and doing CLEs and just continuing ed classes and online research to learn how to run a business. And it, it was like, it's really transferable to a law firm. And it also taught me the importance of those relationships that I had with my mentors, because now I had to go make them right. with strangers and sell and actually market because it was, that was a research company. It wasn't a law firm. So it was very different. And, and that's how I, that's what I did. That's how I jumped. Wow. That's interesting. So being in Tallahassee, how did you find some of the resources and what kind of resources did you take advantage of here in Tallahassee? Once I found the Jim Moran Institute, I couldn't wait to get in. And I had to have, uh, as a, the, the small business executive program required to have a certain number of staff. I, you had to have some traction. You had to have been around for a certain amount of time. And as soon as I hit that mark and I knew I, I would qualify, I applied right away. I think my former, one of my mentors, the person who owned my firm, was involved in the executive, the peer-to-peer -peer groups. Okay. So I'd heard of it. I knew of it. I had done Leadership Tallahassee. So I had a connection with the chamber, and I had a connection with the, the people who ran that. So it was, I was on some email list. I'd heard about it. I saw it, and I just couldn't. I worked really hard to get to the point where I would qualify to apply for the program. Cool. Tell us a little bit about the program and what were some of the things that, that really helped you and what stood out to you and, and what were some of the things that that you maybe changed or, or uh, thought about business differently because going through the program? It really put a head on everything I had been learning. It, it put a fine point on it. So I had been working really hard to understand how to run a business how to look at your numbers every day, how important it is to keep track of money coming in, money going out, making a budget, keeping a budget, how to market, how to sell. That is an art in and of itself, and I have a whole huge respect for people who know how to sell because it's tough. How to, how to brand, how important branding is. 
I had learned all of that. And by the time I got to Jim Moran, it was a program day a month. And it taught it each program day spent some time on each of those topics. And it was like the culmination of everything I'd been studying. It was fun to have somebody else come in and give me and give a lecture, for example, on what is an LLC? What is a corporation? This is stuff that I practice and have been for decades. I teach it to my clients when they come in. So to see somebody else teach it to me from their perspective Mm -hmm. made me a better teacher. It made me a better attorney for my business clients. So there were, there was a lot of different things I took away, reconnected with people. I was able to, the Jim Moran Institute, the, the college or the program offers you a lot of networking opportunities before and after reconnecting with people that I had, that had been in my life as parents of some of the kids that my kids went to daycare with and seeing you follow them on social media, but you don't have an opportunity to sit in a room with them. And now at this point, understanding the importance of connection and the importance of making friends and building a network and relying on that network, I had now a more of an opportunity to do that and build that for myself and my business. And how many weeks was it and about how many people were in your cohort? It was maybe four, I want to say four months, and it was one day a month. Maybe it was six months and one day a month. And there were 20 people carefully chosen, so there was no overlap. There wasn't another lawyer. Okay. The day I walked in, the first day, there were probably three or four people that I was good friends with. I didn't know they were applying. They didn't know I was applying. It was probably another three or four people who I was acquainted with. And then maybe the the rest I had met. But I I can't really give you details about it. But coming out of there, I've gotten phone calls from some of those people that I had just met asking me for help legally and and legal issues. So I think that you just don't know. It really does hit home how important it is to when you meet people you make an impression and you don't know when they're going to need you and they're going to think of you and they're going to call you so that that was a a side effect I hoped would happen but it it has happened yeah I have a good friend Jay Revel you may know Jay but he's a businessman here in in Tallahassee and he's one of the best networkers I know and he always says it's it's not who you know it's who you know and what they think about you, or what they think of you and when. And mm-hmm. that kind of goes to what you're saying. I just, I apologize, Jay, if you're listening to this, I just butchered his beautiful quote. But essentially the idea is like being present and being there. And if somebody thinks, hey, you know what? I need to call Jennifer on this. She's, you know, she's a subject matter expert on that. And that's where the magic happens. Or I know who is. Yeah, or you know who is, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one thing with Jay, I tell people that I don't know everybody in Tallahassee, but I can call somebody who knows everybody in Tallahassee, and that's Jay. He's just, he's really great at at networking and knows the importance. Actually, I have him come in and speak with my students about networking because he's just, he's so genuine. It's not like fake at all. He just loves people and he cares about them and he just has a great way of connecting with people. Interesting. So you also mentioned that you're in the CEO peer to peer. So you extended your experience with JMI. Tell us a little bit about that. If I there's a, if I told you I'd have to do something, I, we're not allowed to talk about it. You sign a confidentiality agreement when you join peer to peer. I can't mm-hmm. talk to you about what happens in peer to peer, but I will tell you that there is an extension mm-hmm. of when you do the when you do the small business program. And there's an opportunity to meet with maybe not even other peers from your cohort, but other people who have gone through the program. And you have an opportunity to kind of spitball ideas and share pain points and experiences so that you have somebody to rely on and feel comfortable share. It's not always easy to say where your failures are. Right, exactly. And you have a place where it's confidential and it's not, people aren't going to be saying, oh, she screwed that up or whatever. And it could be things like, candidly, one of the things that I'm a good lawyer, I know how to do the law part. Learning how to do the business part has been a big challenge. Learning how to incorporate HR and hiring policies and putting together an employment manual mm. and those nuts and bolts things that I never had to do before. Right. I have to, I'm learning it as I go and having a peer group that's already done that and there might not be lawyers, but they're small business owners. They know how to help me through that. 
No, that's great. So just like a personal question, just you personally, do you find yourself naturally learning new things easily or do you like to stay in your wheelhouse? Like I'm a, you said, so I'm a lawyer and I'm not a business person, but the reality is you are a business person. You own a business. Do you find yourself curious and naturally looking for those opportunities to grow or is that a challenge for you? No, that's the fun part. That's the fun part of life. It's not just in business. It's always figuring out what can I do next? What can I learn next? Being humble enough to be the worst person at that thing right. and then climb your way through it and, and reach a new level. That's pretty fun. Yeah, that's a great word. That's a great word. We talked about this, the beginning of your business. Tell us a little bit about where you're now and what are your aspirations and where you want to take your business. We have now, our law firm is two partners. We have a third partner that's not an equity partner. So we have three partners and we have a, a part-time attorney and we have a full staff. And I don't know that we want to grow any bigger. Okay. I, I really like this niche. I really like this boutique style firm. I am able to really be in it with my clients. And our clients are business owners. Our clients are property owners. We do a lot of planning. Mm -hmm. My partner, Michael and I have been through so much litigation over our careers that we've matured out of that and really work hard to keep people out of litigation. Can we do it? Yeah. Do we do it? Yeah. Do we want to do it? No. Mm -hmm. Our whole sort of foundation is let's stay out of court, stay out of conflict. And you do that with planning. And so when you're going to kick off a business, you have the right planning in place. So you're not fighting with your business partners. When you're building your business, you're going to need contracts in place. You're going to need growth. You're going to want to grow and you're going to want to do it properly. You're going to want to do it with protection. When you have built your nest egg, you need estate planning. You need succession planning. You need to make sure that your next phase is steady. It's sturdy. It's going to, it's going to work. And so we want to marshal somebody from beginning to end and just really developing and, and growing and building that, putting us in the premier go-to spot for that is, is what I really want to see happen. It's happening. That's where we are. That's where we want to do. We don't want to, we don't want to be a big firm. It's a lifestyle choice. So I want to go out and learn new things. That's not my business. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to, I just literally yesterday got certified to as open water scuba diver. So I just want to do new things when I want to have the lifestyle that'll let me do that. No, that's really incredible. So talking about just your business and your clients and getting to know them, what's the portrait of your ideal client? If you're like, this would be like, at this stage is the perfect time that they should see me. Well, what does that look like? It looks like yesterday. I will tell people, I have a little soapbox that I get on when I talk to business groups. So like I've talked to you know, real estate agents who, listen, you're an independent contractor, you're a business owner. I've talked to, I've had people come to me saying, I want to buy my mom's business or my dad's business. They know nothing about anything. The first thing that anybody, when they, when they have an idea, is they need a bench, they need a team. And that first team needs to have a lawyer, a CPA, an insurance person, all right? So then they can build their team out from there and they can learn other things. But the ideal client is just depends on what phase you're in. Are you completely at ground zero? We're going to help launch you. Are you already doing business and you want to figure out how to take it to the next level? We can help you. Are you at retirement? We can help you. Are you an adult owning property? And in a lot of what we're working with is real estate. Do you have property? You want to protect it? You want to put some force field around it for liability reasons? We can help you. The ideal client is somebody who takes what they're doing seriously, whether it be in their business life or in their personal life, and they want to make sure they're doing the right things to protect that and make sure that in, gen in the next generation or in the next iteration that their plan is in place and is carried out. That's a good, that's a good word. I always like at the end of a podcast to ask my guest if they could ask or if they could tell themselves one thing before they started, what would, what would you tell Jennifer before you you bought the company you're now leading and scaling and things like that. What's that key bit of advice that would have been critical for you? I think I would say it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Right. You walk in and you're scared to death and things work out. 
But yeah, that's what I would say. Okay, that is going to be okay. All right. Thank you so much for coming in, Jennifer, and the best of luck to you and, and your firm, and just really appreciate you coming in. Thank you for having me. Hey, thank you for tuning in to the Innovation Mindset powered by the Jim Moran College of Entrepreneurship. If you like this episode, do us a favor and hit a, and share it. And if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss another episode. And as always, please comment. We love getting those comments and we answer every single one. We will see you next time.